Welcome to the annual Supreme Court term preview hosted by uh, the Cardozo Florsheimer Center for Constitutional Democracy. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Professor Michael Pollack, one of the uh, current co-directors of the center. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank, if she's not in the room right now, our uh, intrepid uh, uh, administrator, Maura Gingrich, the one who has been making these announcements and who has helped organize this and so many others of our uh, events, uh, not just this year, but for many past years as well. Um, so today we're going to talk a bit about some of the cases uh, and issues that the court is poised to engage with throughout the course of this coming term. As you may or may not know, the term of the court is the court's annual uh, uh, session. 28 U.S.C. Section 2 provides that the term of the court begins on the first Monday in October, and that was two days ago, uh, and runs until the first Monday the following October. So technically, the term is a full year long. Though, in practice, the court hears oral argument in cases only from October to April, and tends to issue decisions in all of those argued cases by the end of June or the very beginning of July. So everything that we discuss today will likely be resolved by the end of June or early July. Uh, so a lot of interesting and important and weighty issues on the court's docket, or at least poised to be on the court's docket. And we're going to go through not all of them, because we don't have time to do all of that, but some of the more salient ones, some of which you might know about, some of which you might not, not know about. Uh, and hopefully we can shed light on all of them. We want to leave plenty of time for questions afterwards. So uh, we're going to try to restrain ourselves in our presentations. Uh, and I really, really encourage you, if you have questions, think of them. Feel free to ask them. And we will try to get through as many as we can before we have to break at 1.30. Um, so I'm joined, of course, by two of my very esteemed colleagues, Professor Echo Yanka and Professor Kate Shaw. Uh, Professor Yanka will get us started by talking about some of the uh, significant criminal procedure and criminal law cases on the docket. And I'm going to talk about some cases involving equal protection, religion, and the administrative state. And then Professor Shaw will bring us home with commentary about uh, a major Second Amendment case uh, the court will hear, and as I'm sure probably is the elephant in the room for everyone, um, the various abortion and abortion-adjacent cases the court uh, will be hearing. So uh, let's begin with Professor Yanka. Hi, everyone. Uh as, been, as has been said, and hopefully I've met most of you, but if not, I'm Echo Yanka, and on my many of the things I teach here are criminal law and criminal procedure, and, and uh, legal theory as well, as well as some of you are wrestling with torts, <laughs> uh, torts with me this semester. Um, but typically when we do the Supreme Court preview, I focus on, as has been mentioned, criminal law and policing issues, and I'm gonna pick a few of them now. Um, for those of you who think that your professors delight in torturing you supportively, and that we do nothing but come up with strange hypotheticals in order to bend your mind, mostly to show you why your arguments will never ever work, um, and why we always have the better argument, I come bearing a ray of hope. There's a case currently in the court, indeed, this, though this is a Supreme Court preview, this is our less, least previewed case uh, that we're going to discuss because this case already went to argument on Monday, so this is in some sense a review of the case. And this case is called Wooden v. United States. Now, for all of you who are on criminal law Twitter, I assume that's all of you, right? <laughs> no, just, just me. Okay. Uh, criminal law Twitter, to the extent I even, uh, that even I indulge in it, delights in, in uh, discussing the um, Armed Career Criminals Act, the ACCA which seems to be in front of the Supreme Court more often than darn near anything the court has wrestled with. This might tell you something about the clarity and um, consequence of this, of this act, which is low clarity, high consequences, um, that so many cases end up in front of the court. And indeed, in this term, at least two ACCA uh, cases are gonna be in front of the court. When the United States was a moment where some of the most talented lawyers in the country went up to the Supreme Court to be made to feel like what else again. Here's what happens. William Wooden breaks into essentially, we're gonna call it Manhattan storage, it's in Georgia, you get the idea. One of these storage units where lots and lots of people have uh, cells, whatever you wanna call them, units, right? This is in 1997. <laughs> That's another thing that you should notice about this case. When this case, uh, when the facts of this case actually occurred, I was graduating 
<laughs> which tells you something about how long it takes something to work its way all the way through the court. In any case, so what does Witten do when he breaks into this um, into this Manhattan storage, Georgia storage like unit? He does what people do when they break into these things. He he knocks over ten of these uh, ten of these units, breaks in, burglarizes them, right? Um, so what happens? He's he's arrested. Uh, He's charged, he serves time in jail, right? Um, pleads guilty and gets out. All right. Many years later, in 2014, a plainclothes police officer goes to Wooden's home. And while he's in his home, he notices that Wooden has a weapon, he has a rifle. He's then charged, because he's an ex-felon, he no longer has the right to have a rifle in Georgia. He's then charged with being a felon in possession of a, of a uh, that case is later dismissed because it turns out that the plainclothes police officer didn't have probable cause to arrest Wooden at the time. I would love to discuss that case with you. And so for all of you who will take criminal procedure with me one day, we're going to have a long, luxurious conversation about that. But that's not even what ends up in front of the Supreme Court. Right? This man's life has been uh, nothing but legal excitement his whole life. Too much legal excitement. I do not recommend it. Right, so what happens? Okay, so after he's charged, he's found guilty at a sentencing hearing of being an armed career criminal. And why is he found guilty of being an armed career criminal? Because he committed 10 burglaries back in 1997. Right? That is to say, the armed career criminal statute, which I won't go into in great depth because of our shortness of time, says that if you've committed crimes on more than one occasion, then you're an armed career criminal. So here's the question the court has to wrestle with. If you and I break into a Manhattan storage and knock over 10 different units, have we committed 10 burglaries on 10 occasions or one burglary? And this is, honest to goodness, the case that's in front of the Supreme Court. A delightful, I, I shouldn't, I mean, a man's life is online. By the way, I said low consequences. The, career criminal, the armed career criminal statute has a mandatory 15 years in prison attached to it. So while, for those of us who find this a legal question that's really interesting and engaging, for Mr. Wooden, a great deal of his life is on the stake here, right? So if I say it's delightful, forgive me, it's my law nerd coming out. And it is not to make light of the fact that for a real man, 15 years of his life, right, whether or not you get to see grandchildren or whatever the case may be, whether or not you get to enjoy a life that's already had quite a lot of incarceration in it is at stake. Nonetheless, it is true that the oral arguments just were, I mean, they were 1L at the <laughs> highest level. Right? What if you break into 10? Uh, what if you break into 11? What if you break into it over two days? Is it one crime? Spree? What if you take a cigarette break in the middle of a burglary? Right? I mean, these are the kinds of questions that these lawyers, these very accomplished lawyers, were having to, to fend off. Um, at all terms. Now, all that being said, um, the case also has a, a shadow in the background, which is there's a precedent from 1986 where the Eighth Circuit uh, confessed errors, uh, confessed an error. The Eighth Circuit precedent held that the robbery of six people in one occasion only constituted one crime. And it wasn't clear how, how the um, petitioners, how the government was going to get past that. But in any case, uh, that's the case that's an issue in the Supreme Court. And it's on these 1L life questions that this man's life turns. As though that weren't enough, there's another a a ACCA case on the docket. This one's called United States v. Taylor. Uh, in this one, it's a little more complicated. The, the subtlety makes it difficult to describe in full. But what happens is a man named Justin Taylor calls up another guy, uh, Mr. Sylvester, Martin Sylvester. He says, I'm going to sell you a bunch of marijuana. I'm going to sell you bulk marijuana. You'll then sell it on the street. You'll make lots of money. It'll be great. Let's meet up in Richmond. The guy says, sure. What Taylor's actually doing is talking to his co-confederate. Um, and they decided they're not going to sell marijuana. They're just going to rob it. Right? And, and they, they rob it. When they get there, they say, give me, give me your money. He refuses. And a wrestling match breaks out. During this wrestling match, tragically, not accidentally, but tragically, I mean, sorry, not intentionally, Accidentally makes it sound like it's coincidence. Um, Taylor's conspirator's gun goes off, killing, killing Sylvester. 
And Taylor is then charged, um, charged with, under the Hobbs Act it's called, with the conspiracy to commit a Hobbs Act robbery. The conspiracy to commit a Hobbs Act robbery, notice the crime, right? It's not the robbery, it's the conspiracy to commit the robbery, is considered a violent crime, which qualifies for the ACCA. He pleads guilty, straightforward case. He's gonna spend many, many years in jail until many years later, right? He's gonna spend 30 years in jail. Many years later, the Fourth Circuit decides that conspiracy to commit a Hobbs Act robbery is itself not a violent crime. And in the subsequent case, they then decide that that ruling is retroactive. And so not surprisingly, Taylor appeals to the Supreme Court to say my conspiracy no longer qualifies as a violent crime and my sentence should be reduced. Um, and that's the question that's in front of the Supreme Court now. All right. Um, Let's talk about a homegrown case, Larry Thompson. Larry Thompson's a Brooklyn guy. This is actually a, a terrific case at Cardozo. Not only is it a homegrown case for New Yorkers, but it touches on one of the things that Cardozo has made its name, one of our crown jewels, at least in ethos, even if this case isn't directly involved. Uh, so Larry Thompson's a Brooklynite. He gets arrested one day. A cop knocks on his door to do uh, a check on his daughter. Now, there's a real question whether or not the, the police officer can enter. Again, a crim pro question that we will delight in talking about, whether or not a welfare check is covered by the Fourth Amendment. In any case, going back to the real world, Mr. Thompson says, I'm not interested in you entering my home, in less elegant language. Right. Thompson and this police officer get into it. The police officer eventually arrests Thompson. Right? They take his daughter to the hospital, where they discover that she has a diaper. So nothing happens. Now, the reason this case, I mean, this case all might sound quite silly, but this case is actually a really important case in the ways in which police can use power at their disposal. The way in which police officers can, for good reasons, i.e. a welfare check on a child, or for bad reasons, i.e. we expect you to do what we tell you when we damn well tell you, can decide to turn interactions that are tense into an arrest. They arrest him, he spends nights in, a couple nights in jail, and then the Prosecutors do what prosecutors always do. They offer to dismiss the case. Thompson's having none of it. I don't want this case dismissed. I'm, he's furious. He refuses to take the plea bargain. Prosecutors, seeing that this guy's not gonna play along, finally just dismiss the case in the interest of justice. None of this, sadly, is remarkable. This happens all the time, right? Police officer arrest people. There's a whole saying in criminal law and criminal theory, the process is the punishment, right? We're not even interested in trying you the process itself is the way in which you're punished. Thompson decides, oh no, not this guy. So he turns around and sues the police for a civil rights infraction. So you can see, for those of you that are long national conversation about police power and accountability, even questions about defunding the police, and when the police are the first or the right people to respond to public health emergencies, are all captured in what looked like a really esoteric case. The law says you cannot sue the police for a civil rights infraction unless essentially your case was found to be, that you were either found to be innocent or that the case was found in circumstances that indicate innocence, something like that. I, I should look up the exact language. I had it here for you. Uh, right, so that your, your case has to be in circumstances that indicate innocence, essentially something like the case your, uh, uh, your, your appeal is uh, granted, right? That's, that's a circumstance where you're found to be functionally innocent, right? Or you're acquitted. That's a case that's... Thompson, of course, was not acquitted. He never went to trial. His case was dismissed, which is true of a huge number of cases in the world, right? The process is the punishment. So the question is, Thompson proposes to the Supreme Court is, can I sue the police if it's the case that my case was found not to indicate innocence, but by facts that are not inconsistent with innocence, i.e., can the police get out of being sued by arresting you? Here's one way to think about it. Can the police get out of being sued by arresting you and then just dismissing the case? Because those facts won't be found to indicate innocence. They just weren't found at all. They weren't tried in any serious way. And Thompson's case is a case that says, you got, we're not going to let you keep doing this anymore. We're not gonna let you just use the process as the punishment itself. And so now the court has to wrestle with the question, is it enough to have a case that is nearly not inconsistent with innocence, right? 
All right, my time has just hit zero. So let me touch the last case just because it's so visible. Mm -hmm. um, this last case, not only is it a preview, but it's a, a sober one and a, a very, very timely one. Indeed, it'll be argued just Monday, I think? Okay. Monday it is. Um, on the same Monday that the Boston Marathon is being run. Okay. Hmm. Oh, wow. right. So it's the Boston Marathon bombing case. And I suppose I don't have to tell you the facts very, very much. Most of you were aware of them, although you were probably somewhat younger or fairly young when it happened. So the Boston Marathon case where the two brothers who set off a bomb during the Boston Marathon killing many people, injuring something like 250. They then, I remember I was somewhere giving a talk. I turned on my TV and suddenly all of Boston is on a manhunt. They're literally searching for this man through these men through Connecticut and Boston. They end up being found hiding in a boat, if you remember. Uh, the two brothers get in a shootout with the police. The older brother is shot and killed. And Tarnoff, uh, this is United States versus Tarnoff, is uh, arrested and tried. He's arrested and tried and eventually convicted and gets the death penalty, right? The case has two prongs to it. The second prong I won't really talk much about. The second prong is the court, uh, an, an appeals court found that he was convicted of three crimes, which presumably or arguably or even there's good evidence that his brother committed, not him. And so those three crimes should be reversed. Um, whether or not the lower court, the trial court erred in not allowing evidence that his older brother committed those crimes should be, should be on the table. But I, I'm ignoring that because the real action is about the death penalty. The real action, indeed, the entirety of the case is really about the death penalty because he's not even challenging the parts of the trial that landed him a lifetime of life uh, sentence in prison. His argument is that the trial court erred in not allowing or not um, not allowing questions to the jurors about how much media and reporting of the Boston Marathon bombing they had absorbed before the trial. And that because these questions were not allowed at voir dire, he could not get a fair trial. I could speak about it for hours, but I'm not going to. I'm only going to stop by saying this. In a world in which we are gripped by certain highly visible, incredibly painful cases, whether it be the Boston Marathon case, the Amon Aubrey case that's coming up, the George Floyd case that concluded recently, it is an obvious question about how prosecutors are going to try cases to know whether or not prosecutors will find those cases invalidated if they don't ask jurors, how much do you know about this case beforehand? How much have you seen on TV? How much do you read on Instagram? How much of this is in your Twitter feed? How much are you living with this case? And on one hand is the question, is this really impossible to get a fair trial in a world in which everybody gets everything instantly on Twitter anyway? Do we really think that makes juries incapable of handling a fair trial? If so, does that mean we lose one very valuable thing, which is the ability of people in their home to try cases that affect them? Right? The people in Boston are going to be saturated by news of this. And if we say that people who at least encounter this in media can't try the cases, it will mean systematically that people in Boston can't try the Boston Marathon bomber, that people in Minneapolis can't try Derek Chauvin. It will have that constant ripple effect. On the other hand is the very powerful impulse that defendants need a fair trial and the question of whether or not you can get a fair trial when people have been so inundated by news that they may already come into the courtroom uh, with, with their minds made up or at least trending that way. The very question of presumption of innocence. And so while these questions seem very technical, the heartbeat of them couldn't be more real. I'm going to stop there. There are a couple others that I will address if they come up in Q&A or if you're interested, but please. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, just on a scheduling note, the argument for this case is going to be next Wednesday. Wednesday it is. It's because right. next Monday, the marathon day, is a holiday. So yes. it, it's a good thing, frankly, the argument's not taking place on the anniversary of the, the marathon. So it will be obviously. Absolutely. Be Absolutely. Day. Yes. Okay. So switching gears a little bit, mine's a little bit more of a hodgepodge of topics rather than a coherent set of cases. Um, I want to talk first about an important equal protection case that is not actually on the court's docket, but could be on the court's docket. Um, which is Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard College. This is a, uh, the latest in a long line of, of, of challenges to the practice of um, race-conscious admissions in higher education. So 
Um, Harvard College is a private undergraduate institution that some of you might have heard of. Um, uh, like many colleges and universities, Harvard considers the race of applicants in its admissions decisions uh, with the goal of assembling a diverse student body. In addition to race, Harvard considers, let me read, personal essays, recommendation letters, extracurricular activities, athletics participation, honors and prizes, intended major, intended career, transcripts, test scores, family and demographic information, alumni or staff interview reports, and samples of academic or artistic work. So race is a factor among many, many things. Harvard also uses a number of race neutral means to improve the diversity of its student body, like generous financial aid programs and recruitment programs. The plaintiffs in this case have sued Harvard, alleging that its admissions policies discriminate on the basis of race in violation of federal law. And specifically, the allegation is that they discriminate against Asian American applicants in violation of federal law. So what is that federal law? So Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 provides that no person in the United States shall, on the ground of race, color, or national origin, be excluded from participation in, be, de be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. And that includes Harvard and many private educational institutions, all of which receive federal uh, financial assistance in the form of grants, in the form of you know, National Science Foundation grants, all sorts of things. Finally, and here's the important kicker, the court has held that this statute's protections are coextensive with the constitutional protections afforded by the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. So we have to look at con law to help us figure out what this statute means. And in a series of cases, uh, dating back a long time, but more recently starting in 2003, the court has grappled with whether and how the Constitution, and therefore Title VI, allow the consideration of race in higher education admissions. So in, there were two cases in 2003 that were heard together, uh, Groths versus Bollinger and Gruder versus Bollinger. So, Lee Bollinger, who at the time was the president of the University of Michigan, more recently was president of Columbia University, which is confusing for the, uh, us New Yorkers who associate the Bollinger name with Columbia. These cases are not about Columbia, these are at the University of Michigan. In the Groth's case, the court held that a university cannot use a rigid point system to consider race in the admissions process, right? You can't get like, get three extra points if you're whatever, right? That's not that's not constitutionally permissible. But in this companion case, Gruder, which has become the more meaningful precedent of the court, the court holds that a university can consider race as a factor among many for the purpose of achieving diversity in higher education. The reason any of this matters, right, is because the Equal, the Equal Protection Clause requires government to treat people equally on the basis of race. And as the one else will learn when they take con law two. Those of you who have taken con law two will know. Uh, when the government classifies people based on race or enacts a law that classifies based on race, uh, the government has to defend that racial classification with the highest level of scrutiny that our law affords, which is that the government has to articulate a compelling governmental interest for that decision and has to use the least racially restrictive means possible to achieve that end. So what the court essentially held in Gruder is that achieving diversity in higher education is a compelling governmental interest that could justify the consideration of race. It is, in fact, in our jurisprudence, the only government interest that the court has said is sufficiently compelling to justify the consideration of race. Um, and the means, this sort of consideration among many, passed the second prong of that test. The rigid point system did not. But somewhat famously, or infamously, uh, at the end of the Gruder opinion, the court, in an opinion by Justice O'Connor, says, quote, we expect that 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary to further the interest approved today, namely diversity in higher education. So 25 years from 2003 is 2028. We're not quite there yet, but we're almost there. Um, so in Gruder, these sorts of affirmative action programs were blessed as a constitutional matter and therefore as a statutory matter under Title VI, um, but maybe had some sort of like sunset provision to them. Uh, challenges didn't stop, though. In 2016, 
In a case called Fisher versus University of Texas, the court very narrowly reaffirmed Grutter, pushed back a sort of frontal assault on Grutter, and held that, in this case, the University of Texas's admissions policies satisfied the Grutter standard. This was, this was a four to three decision. Justice Scalia had died, and Justice Kagan was recused. So it was Kennedy, Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor in the majority, and um, Roberts, Thomas, Alito in the dissent in that case. The attorney in Fisher is the same attorney for the plaintiffs here, in this case. Right, so this case is an effort to try again for what opponents of affirmative action didn't get in Fisher and didn't get in Grutter, which is now the rejection of Grutter and an end to the consideration of race in uh, university admissions. That's not just me sort of telling you that's what the goal is, that is what the cert petition says. The cert petition filed by the plaintiffs explicitly asks the court to overrule Grutter and to say that race cannot be considered at all uh, in higher education admissions decisions, whether the public school is public or private, because even if it's private, Title VI applies. Um, so the assumption, right, on that side of the case must be that this newly composed court will be more amenable to that argument than the court was uh, a short few years ago in 2016, even though we are sort of six or seven years more impatient than um, the Grutter 25-year line. And by the way, I'm being a little bit facetious because, of course, like that 20, that's not like the law that like in 2028, affirmative action stops. That like that, that, that was dicta. Um, I'm just pointing out that uh, plaintiff's counsel is more impatient than that dicta was. Um, now, unlike some of the other cases we're talking about, this is not actually on the court's merits docket yet. The cert petition was filed. So this case was litigated in the district court in Massachusetts. First Circuit both ruled in favor of Harvard because Grutter says this is OK. Um, so the plaintiffs filed this petition in February. Uh, the court invited the Biden administration to weigh in on whether the court should take the case, should grant the petition or not. Um, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, presumably, I'm guessing, this administration will tell the court not to take the case, um, that you know, this petition doesn't actually present, there's no circuit split, there's no disagreement among the lower courts, this is just you don't like the outcome in this case and you want the court to overrule Grutter, that's not worthy of the court's time, unless, of course, the court wants to overrule Grutter, and the Biden administration will probably say, don't do that. Here are the reasons why you shouldn't do that, right? So I think the Solicitor General will say, don't take the case. But I suspect at least four justices, and remember, it only takes four justices to grant a petition, um, will be interested in revisiting Grutter. And so I would not be shocked if they grant this petition and set the case for oral, oral argument either late in the spring or early next fall. So we might be talking about this all over again a year from now in our preview for uh, the next term if they don't get to it in this term. Or maybe they'll be so exhausted from dealing with the other controversial things we're talking about that they won't <laughs> want to hear about this. We'll have to see. Um, you know, but again, the stakes here, I think it's important to be clear about. This is not about only public institutions. This is really about any educational institution and its ability to consider race at all, even as a factor among many um, when deciding whom to admit. And so what is really at stake here is this question of sort of is the Constitution quote unquote colorblind to the extent that it requires ignoring race even when ignoring race produces more structurally, race, structurally racist or structurally disparate outcomes. Um, so that's what's at stake in this Harvard case and it's what's always been at stake in these repeated challenges to affirmative action. Switching gears now to religious liberty. So there are actually a bunch of religious liberty cases and petitions pending. Uh, over the summer, those of you who are sort of tuned into the, the shadow docket and uh, the, the emergency orders, there were a lot of religious challenges to various COVID restrictions, uh, houses of worship, things like that. Um, there is include there's one pending petition the court has not acted on yet, has, has not granted or denied it, um, called Catholic Diocese of Albany versus Lacewell. Uh, this is a challenge to a religious liberty challenge to a New York state law requiring that employer health insurance plans cover abortion. Uh, that law has religious exemptions in it, but the plaintiffs say they're not good enough. There aren't, they're not broad enough uh, religious exemptions. Um, so we might hear from the court about that. But I want to focus with limited time on this case called Ramirez versus Collier, because this is at the intersection both of religious liberty and capital punishment. This case will be heard on November 1st. So a 2000, year 2000 federal statute called RELUPA, my property students will know my 
my favorite statute, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. Wait, you, you have a favorite statute? I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, except I actually hate this statute, right. so it's my favorite to talk about, right? But oh, it's, I yeah, see, yeah. I, see. Um, uh, I thought I was a No. <laughs> so RELUPA protects prisoners from substantial burdens on their religious exercise unless the government can justify that burden with the same sort of compelling interest, least restrictive means thing I just talked about in the uh, uh, affirmative action context. So John Ramirez is on death row in Texas. He was actually set to be executed on September 8th, um, but the court stayed his execution so that they could grant this petition and hear this case in November. Um, so Ramirez, his challenge is not to his conviction, it's not to his eligibility to be executed. He's arguing that he wants his minister to be able to be in the room, the execution chamber with him, and to lay his hands, the minister's hands, on Ramirez's body as part of his last rites as he dies. He also wants the minister to be able to say prayers aloud while he dies. Ramirez alleges that both the laying of hands and the audible prayers are part and parcel of his religious practice. The state of Texas will after begrudgingly refusing to do even this in earlier cases, will allow a minister to be present in the room, but does not allow the minister to touch the person being executed, nor to speak aloud. It, Texas's claim is that these limitations, the no touching and the no speaking aloud, do not substantially burden Ramirez's religious exercise, and that even if they do, they're necessary to, to achieve this compelling governmental interest. So there are a few possible, very complicated jurisdictional issues that are difficult for Ramirez to potentially overcome. And I'm not gonna talk about them because no one needs to hear more about habeas law. It's very confusing. But if Ramirez can overcome these jurisdictional issues, I think it's likely that the court will rule in his favor, which again, will not mean that he will be spared from execution. It just means that when he is executed, he will be able to have his minister put his hands on him and. Uh, deliver these audible prayers. And the reason, I have two reasons for that. One is the court having stayed the execution at all suggests that there's at least some members of the court who think this is a real claim. And the other reason is that I think, and this is just me talking, that Texas's argument that there is no substantial burden on religion is frankly extremely difficult to defend. And the reason it's difficult to defend is that Texas told us it was very difficult to defend a few years ago in a very different context. So in a 2013 case called Burwell versus Hobby Lobby, the court considered whether a federal requirement that employer health insurance cover contraception, whether that requirement imposed a substantial burden on the religious exercise of employers who objected to the use of contraception. The court held that it did, so substantially burdened, but that's not the point. Texas joined an amicus brief in that case. And in this amicus brief, Texas, it wasn't Texas's brief, but they're one of the signatories. The amicus brief says this, quote, a federal court should not even engage in the weighing of religious doctrine. Rather, the courts should accept the good faith belief of the plaintiffs that the religious principles on which they operate prohibit them from doing what the law requires. So that's what they said in 2013. In this case, Texas's brief says that Ramirez's good faith belief that he must be touched and have these audible prayers isn't enough. And it says, as if the following were obviously ludicrous, quote, if all it takes to establish a substantial burden is sincerity and an integral belief, a plaintiff could establish the substantial burden simply by saying so. And I would say, yeah, that's what you <laughs> said in 2013, and the court agreed with you. So, yes. Like, if the tables have turned and you didn't like it, maybe you shouldn't have made that argument before. Um, Maybe you should have thought about the fact that someday you might be the one who is alleged to be imposing a substantial burden. So I think under Texas's own prior arguments, under Hobby Lobby, the argument that Ramirez is experiencing a substantial burden is almost certainly true. And then the issue would simply be, is there a compelling state interest in not having someone touch him as he dies? And I think it's very hard to explain how that could possibly be the case. So final thing I'm gonna say real quick is this uh, final case called American Hospital Association versus Becerra. Now what this case is about couldn't be more boring and I'm not gonna talk about what it's about. I'm gonna talk about what it implicates, which is not boring at all. So as some of you will recall from either admin law or elements or other classes, federal courts are supposed to defer 
to interpretations of statutes offered by federal administrative agencies, so long as those interpretations are of ambiguous text and are reasonable. This is called the Chevron Doctrine, named after the Chevron case from 1984 in which the court announced this rule. Some members of the court have been targeting Chevron for years. Justice Gorsuch is one of them. Justice Thomas is one of them. There's a lot of skepticism about whether we should have this doctrine anymore and whether instead courts should be just the interpreters of statutes. Should agencies get to have any sort of first move or advantage in interpreting statutes? The hospital association in this case is challenging some HHS regulation, again, not important. Their argument is not that Chevron is bad. Their argument is just that the statute is clear and therefore the agency has nothing to interpret. They're represented by Don Verrilli, who is the Solicitor General under the Obama administration. I think that's all he wants. Just a narrow win for his clients, no big change. But a number of amicus briefs have been filed urging the court to take this opportunity to ditch Chevron and say that going forward, agencies will get no special deference on their interpretation of statutes. And as I said, there is some receptive audience on the court for that. Whether there's enough of them, and whether there's enough of them to do it in this case, I don't know. Um, but it would be a pretty big deal if that happened here or at some point, and it would mark a real shift in power away from agencies and toward the federal courts, which are largely staffed by judges hostile to regulation and administrative power. So I'm going to leave it there and turn it over to Chris Rochelle. All right. Um, so before I start talking about the cases that I'm going to cover today, I just wanted to flag a couple of things about the court term that just started. So Professor Pollack read you the statute that provides that the term will start on the first Monday in October, but this is a different first Monday than other first Mondays because we all now for the first time have real time audio access to the justices doings on the bench. So the court is notoriously hostile to change and to transparency, but they really had no choice during the height of the COVID, well, the last, the height, <laughs> the previous height of the COVID pandemic. So from the spring, from I, they, they last sat in March of 2020, and they typically hear cases argued in a pretty small courtroom packed with a couple hundred lawyers and members of the public. And so they couldn't do that, of course. Um, and so they started hearing purely telephonic arguments and all of us got to listen in in real time. And it was very, very cool. And I think really helped acquaint a lot of the public with the doings of the Supreme Court. And they were on phones and there were some like funny technical difficulties and somebody flushed a toilet at one point. <laughs> like, so some things happened. They figured it out after a month or so. Um, and there was a real question when they returned to the bench as they did this week of whether we would continue to get real time audio access to their arguments. And the answer so far is yes, we do. So if you go to the Supreme Court's website, there is for the first time a little button that says live audio and you can just listen to the arguments live streamed in real time at 10 a.m., usually Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I mean, I should say, the justices have a really good gig. They hear, they hear cases like two hours a day, three days a week, two weeks a month, seven months a year. Like, it's, it's good. Um, but during those windows of time, you can listen live to the arguments. And so when Professor Yonka was talking about some of the questions the advocates in Wooden, the Armed Career Criminal Act case, were getting, that's because we could all listen. Um, so you know, I assume you're all here, you're interested in this stuff, like dip in a little bit. It's actually really interesting in real time to listen to how these arguments unfold. I think to the extent you're interested in litigation, it's an amazing window into advocacy at the highest level, but also will give you some substantive insight into the kind of pressing questions presented by the cases that we're talking about today and other ones, even ones that are not, you know, catching headlines uh, are really pretty interesting too. There was an original action case argued Monday or a dispute between two states about water rights. And actually those can be weirdly interesting. So, so I encourage you to dip in if you are ever available at 10 a.m. during those uh, days of the week. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a couple of abortion cases, as Professor Pollock previewed for my con law two students. I know this is a lot, right? We just finished doing Casey and Whole Woman's Health uh, this week. Um, but I don't think we really talked, well, we didn't really talk about the Mississippi case I'm going to talk about. We did talk to some degree about the Texas case. But these, this is a hugely important constitutional issue. We may be on the precipice of seeing change in really dramatic ways. And so I think it's okay if there's a little bit of repetition. Um, all right, so I'm going to briefly talk about three cases. Um, one that'll be argued December 1st out of Mississippi called Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Center. Um, several cases challenging the constitutionality of a Texas abortion law known as SB8. Um, and then third, an ostensibly procedural case out of Kentucky that will be argued next week 
um, but that involves abortion and may send some important signals about how the court is likely to approach the other abortion cases either on its docket or likely to come uh, before it. Okay, so I'm going to start with Texas. Um, So SB 8 is a Texas law that went into effect on September 1st. It bans most abortions in Texas after about six weeks since a last menstrual period. So that is a very, very early ban. Most people don't know they're pregnant six weeks after last menstrual period. That means you missed a period about two weeks ago. Um, So if you're busy or having a regular period or for many, many other reasons, you may not even realize you're pregnant. And by the time you do, it's too late under Texas law to obtain an abortion, except in a case of a medical emergency. But that's not really defined. It's not at all defined in the statute. And it's not at all clear what that means. Um, So this is a ban, right? But it's a ban that's not a typical ban because it's not enforced by state officials, uh, but instead by private parties who are incentivized with a bounty of a minimum of $10,000 to file a lawsuit in Texas state court against anyone they believe has performed an abortion or aided or abetting the performance of an abortion. If they win, they get the $10,000, minimum $10,000 bounty and any attorney's fees they have incurred. So... It's an unusual law, right, because it creates this bounty and this private enforcement scheme. It's also, as a six-week ban, facially unconstitutional under the court's precedence on the constitutional right to abortion. So the court has said states can regulate abortion in all kinds of ways, sometimes in ways that make it harder to access abortion, but they can't ban abortion prior to fetal viability, right, prior to the point where a fetus could live outside the womb, which is in the 23 or 24, maybe 22-week range, but certainly not six weeks. Law is facially unconstitutional. Nobody, including Texas, really disputes that. The question is how you could get to a court to get a court to actually pronounce the law unconstitutional. And it turns out it's difficult because of the way the law is designed. So for those of you who have taken federal courts, um, you may know that the Supreme Court has basically read the 11th Amendment to the Constitution to say you can't sue a state directly, right? So you can't If you're an abortion provider, you can't sue the state of Texas to say, Texas, that law is obviously unconstitutional. But under a 1908 case called Ex parte Young, the court has said, look, you can sue state officials for prospective injunctions, right, for violating federal law. The idea is you're suing a state official, you're not suing the state itself. So then that's fine, and there's no 11th Amendment problem. But the court has said, look, when you're doing this Ex parte Young analysis, you have to look at the state officials and figure out kind of how connected they are to the enforcement of the state law. And what the right, who the right state official is here is very unclear. So a group of abortion providers filed a lawsuit challenging Texas SB 8 and named as defendants a class of all of the state judges in Texas, the state clerks, the administrative clerks who actually like give you the paperwork and docket your complaint when you file a complaint, and then a handful of other state officials and a private party who had publicly announced prior to the you know, actual effective date of SB 8, that he was planning to file one of these lawsuits against an abortion provider. So in the district court in Texas, the district court did this analysis and said, yeah, you know, there's this 11th Amendment immunity doctrine, there's this case ex parte young, let's take a look. And yeah, we think actually these defendants are the right defendants. They're kind of enforcing the law, right? They're the ones who actually allow you to go to court, right? They're the state officials involved in the enforcement. So, okay, you can proceed with your action. Um, But it's a little unclear, right? Because there hasn't been a law like this before and they don't enforce the law in the way executive branch officials typically enforce a law. If it's a criminal law, right? You have police officers and prosecutors who actually enforce the law that way. This is different. Um, So the Fifth Circuit put the district court holding, the, the district court ruling on hold and these providers, the ones who had filed the initial complaint went to the Supreme Court to ask the Supreme Court either to block the Texas law from going into effect on September 1st, or to dissolve an injunction that the, the, or dissolve a stay the Fifth Circuit had issued that had stayed this district court preliminary injunction. So it's a little, a little procedurally complicated, but district court said, no, this law can't go into effect. Fifth Circuit said, oh yes, it can. And the Supreme Court basically said, you know, we're just not sure that this law, that this lawsuit has named the right parties. And in the face of this kind of uncertainty, these tricky procedural questions, eh, we're going to let the law go into effect. So they first said they first said nothing. They let the law go into effect the night in, in, an, in an inaction, the night before the law went into effect. And about 24 hours later, the night of September 1st, so 24, 24 hours after most abortions had stopped in Texas, they wrote this opinion explaining that they were unsure about the kind of this procedural question about who the right defendants were. And so they weren't going to intercede. 
that was a 5-4 decision, unsigned, and drew dissents from the three liberal me members of the court and the chief justice, which is pretty interesting that he crossed over um, to side with the liberal uh, justices. So that's so that case is now back down in the in the lower courts, the lower federal courts. Although there has been no additional activity, um, that's not true. The Fifth Circuit wrote an, an opinion explaining what it had previously done, but the district court hasn't moved forward. I think the Fifth Circuit has not has still has jurisdiction of, over the case. Meantime, the federal government has filed a complaint. Okay, it has said. I see there are these immunity problems with private parties trying to challenge the suit, but the federal government isn't subject to the same 11th Amendment bar against suing a state that private parties are. So we, the United States, can sue Texas, the case is captioned United States versus Texas, for violating the Constitution as the Supreme Court has interpreted it. So that's another case challenging SB 8. There was a hearing in federal district court this Monday. I was like also live streamed, right? The courts are doing better and better on transparency. So I was listening to this on my phone right outside of my Con Law 2 class and then just put my phone away and went inside. But what I heard of the argument, the federal government seems to be in a good position. I think there's a good chance that, they, that the district court will side with uh, the federal government in this suit. Then yesterday, um, there was another interesting development, which is that three private parties so far have come forward to sue one particular abortion provider. So a doctor in Texas, Alan Braid, wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post announcing that he had violated the Texas law. He had performed an abortion after six weeks um, and that he had done so because he had a professional obligation to provide his patient with the best care and consistent with her constitutional rights and also to provide courts another opportunity to weigh in on the constitutionality of this law. So three plaintiffs have stepped forward to sue Dr. Braid. The first was a disbarred and disgraced, these are his terms, Arkansas lawyer who filed a complaint from home confinement in Arkansas for fraud. So he, um, so, but there's nothing in the Texas law that says you can't do that. So he's a perfectly appropriate plaintiff, it seems. Um, and then two other private parties have, have filed complaints against Dr. Braid. So the Center for Reproductive Rights filed what's known as an interpleader action in an Illinois federal court seeking to combine these three plaintiffs um, and to provide yet another opportunity for a federal court to rule on the constitutionality of the Texas law. I've just like completely exhausted my knowledge of federal interpleader, so that's all I'll say about that. I'm not sure. It seems creative and interesting. I don't know how plausible it is under federal precedent regarding the appropriate sort of use of the interpleader device, but it seems facially quite plausible to me. Ask your civ pro professor. Please do that. <laughs> Just spring it on them. Um, uh, but I, I actually suspect that they will have some views on this. Um, okay, so that's one. So there's three possible ways the Supreme Court could get this Texas case. I'm not sure when. In the meantime, functionally on the ground in Texas, there is no access to legal abortion for 85 to 90 percent of people. There are some people who know they're pregnant very early, but it's a small minority of people who get pregnant. So most people in Texas who wish to obtain abortion care are traveling to nearby states, which are being really burdened uh, by the influx in Texas women. There are people who I am sure are resorting to self-administered abortions and who are also carrying to term pregnancies that they would not otherwise choose to carry to term. Um, it's a microcosm of what the country could look like if the Supreme Court does overrule Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which it may well do in the next case I will talk about. So that's uh, Mississippi versus Dobbs, uh, sorry, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Center. It's a case out of Mississippi. Um, so Mississippi passed another abortion ban. This was a 15 week ban, not a six week ban. So, um, you know, kicks in later in a pregnancy and traditionally structured, right? So a ban that doesn't get enforced by private parties, but by state officials. Moderate. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, so, in, so the Fifth Circuit, right, the con very conservative Fifth Circuit took a look at the Mississippi law and said, as it had to, that, that, that the law was inconsistent with the Supreme Court's abortion cases and thus needed to be struck down. So the Fifth Circuit held that the law was unconstitutional. And Mississippi came to the Supreme Court and said, well, you know, will you take a look? And laws like this get passed all the time in the states. States seek to restrict and sometimes ban abortion, sometimes in ways that contravene uh, the Supreme Court's precedents. And typically what happens is the lower courts strike those laws down and the Supreme Court doesn't take the cases because they're obviously right. This was different, right? So the Supreme Court sat on this petition for months and months and months. And last spring, once Justice Barrett had been on board for about seven or eight months, I think at that point, the court surprised a lot of people by agreeing to take the case. And it seemed likely that it agreed to take the case because it's not just gonna say thumbs up, Fifth Circuit, you got it right, but because it's gonna say something to change the constitutional law of abortion. Um, so that case will be argued December 1st. The state of Mississippi is now asking, in its cert petition it didn't make this request, but it is now asking the court directly to overturn Roe and Casey. 
and to find that the Constitution doesn't protect a right to an abortion. Um, and I think many people think there's a good chance that it will do that. It will accept Mississippi's invitation and either explicitly say those cases are wrong and should be overruled, or will simply narrow their holding so that it is much easier for states to restrict abortion, including to prohibit it, much earlier than this point of pe fetal viability that I just talked about. So 15 weeks, 12 weeks, 10 weeks, um, there won't be much left to a constitutional right to abortion if the court upholds this Mississippi law. Although, you know, it's still, it, it may be a couple of steps before the court actually overrules outright Roe and Casey. But if the composition of the Supreme Court does not change, it seems very likely, if not certain to me, that that is the path that the court is on. Um, and I think we will get more of a sense of whether I'm right about that prediction in a case that'll be argued next week. So as I said, there's a, a third abortion case ready um, to be argued. And again, it's a procedural case. I'll be brief on this one. Um, it involves another restrictive abortion law. This is a Kentucky law that prohibits a form of second trimester abortion. So Again, abortion providers challenged this, the, the law, named some state officials as defendants, the Kentucky Attorney General, Secretary of Health and Family Services, and a couple of other state officials. The Attorney General filed a, 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 an answer basically saying, I'm not responsible for enforcing the law. I'm not a proper defendant. Can you dismiss me from this case? And filed with it a proposed order and stipulation of dismissal, basically agreeing saying, please dismiss, he, dismiss me and I will be bound by any final judgment in this case. Okay, The Office of the Attorney General will be bound by any final judgment. So the court issues that order. There's a trial with different state officials as defendants. The district court issues a permanent injunction, right, says the law is unconstitutional. The secretary appeals. The court of appeals affirms the trial court ru ruling. And in the interim, there's an election of a new attorney general. So after the appeals court has affirmed what the district court has done, the new attorney general tries to intervene in the case as a party to say, wait, I want to defend the law again. It's a different attorney general, but the office is the same. And the panel of the court of appeals said, no, you can't do that. It's way too late. You already agreed to be bound, uh, et cetera. Um, and the attorney general said, hey, Supreme Court, will you take a look at this, at this set of arguments that I should be allowed into the case to defend both this Kentucky law and, and, and to raise an argument about whether these providers, uh, providers of abortions, even have standing to assert the rights of women. Um, and the court, it's, you know, so there are a number of problems with the Attorney General's argument. First, there is this waiver argument, right? He agreed to be bound by the rulings below. A lot of the time, you know, you're sort of stuck with if you waive an argument or take a position that you are bound to that position. So it seems as though he has waived the argument he is making now. There's also a jurisdictional problem. He waited more than 30 days. Um, you know, he tried to intervene way more than 30 days after the district court's decision in the case. That seems like a jurisdictional problem. And then the merits of the argument that he wishes to raise are ones that are very suspect under the Supreme Court's precedent, including recent precedent. So for like at least three distinct reasons, I don't think this attorney general has any business being before the Supreme Court. And yet if the court kind of reaches to allow him to participate in this litigation and sort of what it says along the way, I think will send strong signals regarding how eager the court is to sort of get to the merits of these questions of the constitutional protection for abortion and how and on how kind of fast a timeline. So I think there will be signals in this case, even though it's kind of one level removed from a substantive kind of question about abortion in the constitution. How am I doing on time? Um, I will say two minutes, can I do two minutes on the gun case? Yeah. Um, so there's also, if all these abortion cases are not enough, um, we have a very, very big Second Amendment case that the court will hear uh, in November. Um, so the background here is that, as many of you know, in 2008, the Supreme Court decided District of Columbia versus Heller, which held that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to keep a gun at home. Okay, But at issue in Heller was a DC law that was really, it was about handgun ownership and home possession at home of a usable firearm was really all that was at issue. So the Second Amendment protects the right to keep and bear arms. So Heller was really about the keeping part. In this case, the court is set to hear is really about the bearing of arms, like out in public part. Um, so in the decade, so Heller is 2008, two years later, the court, deci court decides a case called McDonald that extends the right announced in Heller to the states. So both the states and the federal government are bound by the Second Amendment. But in the intervening decade plus, the Supreme Court hasn't said anything substantive about the meaning of the Second Amendment. And there's a lot of case law that has developed in the lower courts in the interim. 
Um, lower courts have looked at like laws restricting the kinds of weapons you can have, permitting requirements, felon disqualification laws, and largely allowed state laws regulating guns in lots of different ways to stand under the Second Amendment. It said the Second Amendment gives you a right, but also gives states latitude to regulate that right. Um, and the question here is whether, so A, what the court will say about what the Second Amendment means outside the home, and B, if the court is gonna give some guidance regarding what kind of review any kind of firearm restriction has. So the New York law that's at issue is a law that basically requires if you want a permit to carry a concealed weapon, you have to show good cause, right? So there's a licensing official who takes a look at your request and says, do you just say like, I wanna carry a gun because I feel safer if I carry a gun? Or do you have some reason that you specifically, as compared to any other New Yorker, have reason to believe you're in danger or need to carry a gun. And if you can't show the second to the satisfaction of a licensing officer, you can't get a weapon to carry a concealed, you can't get a license rather to carry a concealed weapon. And the challengers argue that this licensing regime that requires special cause and vests a lot of discretion in these officials is inconsistent with the second amendment. So there's a question about whether they'll strike this law down and say, no, New York has to be more permissive in allowing people to get licenses to carry concealed weapons, whether it says no, sort of for cause regime that you know only gives some members of the public access to the ability to carry concealed weapons is consistent with the second amendment i don't think they'll go as far as the second but i think you know whatever they say is very likely to result in cities and states having a much harder time regulating to limit the number of concealed weapons on the streets and that has very serious consequences in a crowded urban place like new york city uh, where all of a sudden many many more people could be traveling on the subway and elsewhere with guns in their pockets or purses i mean th those are the real stakes of this case um so um so that's a very very big one both as a matter of kind of constitutional doctrine methodology what will the court say history teaches us about what permissible regulations look like in the gun sphere, um, and that will have extremely concrete real, real world, world effects. So if some of this seems abstract, you know, it's not. Uh, okay, so I'll stop there, turn it back over to Professor Pollock.